Psalm 145. I'm dealing with and continuing on our study of the model prayer that Jesus gave us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil and now. And thine is the power or the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Psalm 145 gives, I think, a good interpretation or a good understanding from David's perspective of this idea of for thine is. Giving God the glory for having possession of his own kingdom, being all-powerful, and the glory belonging to him. So I'm going to read through Psalm 145 and just think about the Lord as you hear these words. Psalm 145, I will extol thee, my God, O King, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. Every day will I bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise thy works to another, and shall declare thy mighty acts. I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty, and of thy wondrous works. And men shall speak of the might of thy terrible acts, and I will declare thy greatness. They shall abundantly utter the memory of thy great goodness, and shall sing of thy righteousness. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. All thy works shall praise thee, O Lord, and thy saints shall bless thee. They shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power, to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. The Lord upholdeth all that fall, and raiseth up all those that be bowed down. The eyes of all wait upon thee, and thou givest them their meat in due season. Thou openest thine hand, and satisfiest the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways, and holy in all his works. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, and to all that call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. He also will hear their cry and will save them. The Lord preserveth all them that love him, but all the wicked will he destroy. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord, and let all flesh bless his holy name forever. So... David here exemplifies what I believe you got to just tag on to the end of your prayer. I understand we begin by saying, you know, our Father who art in heaven, we're, we're, we're thinking of Him, meditating upon who we're interacting with, thinking about the fact that He is indeed our Father. We have, we have possession of that. We can, we, can, we can own Him, essentially, as, he, as we belong to Him. And then David rounds out in this psalm what I think it's me meant when it says, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. They're saying, you know, um, just like David says here, My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord, and let all flesh bless his holy name forever. He talks about here about one generation praising thy works to another and declaring his mighty acts. And there down in verse 11 it says, they shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power, to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. The statement is just being made and sung on high that, that all is his, and he deserves to be praised for it. All belongs to God, and anything that he gives us is because of his wonderful grace towards us. We need to recognize our God as the giver of all. And and he gives us of what is rightfully his. I mean, if God created the whole earth and the universe around it, spun everything into existence by his word, it rightfully belongs to him and therefore he can do with it as he will. And glory to God, he chooses to give us an opportunity, an example to pray unto him so that we can have access to the very things that belong unto him. He's the giver of what is rightfully his, and we receive it of the same. 
Jesus as that giver, that first um, gift, essentially, the, the, the pinnacle gift, even realized this truth. Go to John chapter 17. John 17. And in John chapter 17, you'll find as that first gift, Jesus also realizes that God was the giver of even himself. God so loved the world that he gave, right? And so here Jesus is praying unto the Father uh, this, this kind of last prayer as he's about to leave his children. He's about to leave this world in the flesh. And he asks during his prayer that everything that he has received of the Father, he could carry forth and give unto us. Look at John chapter 17 by example. This is Jesus' prayer unto the Father. And also another good thing that we should think about when we're thinking about thine is. It belongs to him, his kingdom, his power, his glory. It belongs to him forever and ever and ever. And here Jesus is praying to God the Father in that same spirit. These words, verse 1, spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy son that thy son also may glorify thee. And as you're walking through this, you're going to see this word. It says, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. God even gave Jesus the work that, that he needed to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. So everything that the Father has given unto Jesus to minister to us by was given him of the Father. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me. Notice they came first from the Father by gift. That prayer, again, we say, Our Father which art in heaven, we, we ended off by remembering that it's his. It, everything belongs to him. And everything that we bring to his account in petition, bring to his, his mind and, and to his throne room by petition, if he gives it to us, it's out of that which he has. It's, it's according to the abundance that he has. And even here, Jesus Christ says, I have given them the words that you have given me. They have received them and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. Down in verse 11 it says, And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep thou through thine name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name, those that thou gavest me. And we can continue down in verse 22. It says, And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them that they may be one, even as we are. I and them, thou and me, that they may be made perfect in one, as, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world, O righteous Father. The world hath not known thee, but, thee, but I have known thee. And these have known that thou did, hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. So Jesus here, as his last prayer, and even as he asked us and, and commanded the disciples to finish off their prayer, gives all glory to God for everything that he has given them. For thine it is, for his it is, kingdom, his power, his glory. It's all his that he could impart it unto us by gift, according to as he will. Go over to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not 
fruit he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. What a profound statement there. Without Christ, ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. What is he saying here? Even as the Father hath given him of all things that he could impart it unto you, he's saying you need to be close, not just close, but connected to the vine. The giver of life, the giver of sustenance, the giver of all things, yea. The beginning of receiving is knowing who is the one that's going to give something to you and getting close to him. Isn't that what we do when we take somebody to, to prayer before God? We say, hey, you need to understand that the giver of eternal life is God. You need to get close to God. You need to make sure that God is here, down here, ready to hear your words. And you call out to him because he is the giver of what you desire. Here Jesus says, if you abide in me and I in you, then you have connection with that life branch, that life of vine that will give you what you desire. He says and extends it even further, without me you can do nothing. So why do you expect that God would answer the list of prayers that he gave you as a type and as an example in his model prayer if you're not understanding that it was all his to give in the begin with? He is the possessor of it and he imparts it unto you. Truly then, the statement is made, without him you can do nothing. But if we abide in him... Jesus makes the statement, then ask what you will and it shall be done. If you're abiding with him, if you understand that he's the giver, if you're coming to him directly with that petition, it will be done according to his will. Turn to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. We need to get to a point and a place where we count on, where we trust in, where we believe upon, where we rely upon holy God as the giver of all things, especially in our prayer life. Sometimes we go to God and we start praying, and as we're meditating upon God and trying to ask Him for a provision, whether it be financial or health-wise, and we start praying to God and saying, God, give me that good health. Give me that stable job. Give me the finances, the resources. Give me the opportunity to do such and such. In the back of our mind, as we're asking God, we're scheming about all of the ways that we ourselves are going to provide those things for ourselves. Isn't that true? Isn't that so often the case? I've got a million different ways that I'm going to get that thing that I'm desiring, but just to kind of go through the motions, I'm going to ask God for them and hope that he would provide those things. You're being double-minded in that. And yet God says, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And that's the thing that we need to think about as we pray to him and ask him for things is that he's the giver of it all. And so trust in him and count that he is able to give it to you. And yet he wants to give it to you if you're praying according to his will. And Amen. don't be double-minded and always thinking about some other way that you're going to do it yourself. I'm relying on God to pay off this debt that I have. But I got like all these other plans that I'm going to do, you know, just in case God's not in the business of answering prayers. I, I need this car work done. How am I going to save up the money to do this? I need my person in my life to get saved and this loved one to get born again. How am I going to figure out a way to do this? God's always got a better plan for all these things. So Amen. if we acknowledge the fact in our prayer that as we're asking him for provision and as we're asking him for health and as we're asking him that he wouldn't lead us into temptation but would, would give us a more direct path to his will, when we finish off our prayer, we need to understand, God, you're the giver of all these things. You have all these in your possession. Thine is the kingdom. Thine is the power. Thou is the glory forever and ever. Amen. You're in control of these things. And whatever you got figured out for how you're going to bless me and how you're going to answer my prayer, I just trust you to do it. And you just kind of leave it there. 
I think that's what Jesus did, even when he said, hey, God, you're providing all these things. All that you've given me is thine, and he just kind of leaves it there. It's his last prayer, really, before he ascends to be with the Father, and it was for us. He understood, hey, God, you've given me all these people, and whatsoever you're going to do with them, it's in your hands entirely now. And he gives it over to God the Father to provide for what they need according to his will to do the job that he has for them. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24... The Bible says no man can serve two masters. And so as you're praying, just think about that by, by, by an example. You can't serve two masters. You can't have in your mind how you're going to do something, and then in your mind also how you think God would do something. You're kind of being double-minded, and you're serving two masters. You've got yourself that you're trying to work something out with. You've got God the Father that you're trying to ask that he would work something out for you, and you're being double-minded in this area. But you can't serve two masters. You either hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And that's the true context. You can't serve God, and you can't serve money. Now, you can't lift them both up as if they're going to kind of get you through these things. Just kind of, you know, whatever works out. Whether God, whether money provides my solution or whether God provides that solution. You, you can't serve them both. You're going to hate one, love the other. You're always going to be split between the two. And more often, you're going to love money. And therefore, verse 25 says, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. And here's what I really wanted to focus in on. Take no thought to your life. What ye shall eat, what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on, is not the life more than meat, and the body more than raiment. Okay? So why are we always considering the things that we're asking God for? We're taking thought for how we're going to provide our food. We're taking thought for how we're going to provide our drink. We're taking thought for how we're going to provide for us and our family what we're going to put on. It's not your life more than this, the Bible says. It's not your life the true vine, which you're trying to attach yourself to and abide in. It's not your life Christ, but why are you making your life about meat and about the body and about clothing? Behold the fowls of the air, they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought, okay, so here's what we do, right? We're going to take thought of how we can solve our issues. Even in our prayer life, we're praying to God, God, I need help with this petition. But then you're like scheming about how you're going to do it yourself. Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit to his stature, right? Which of you, by taking thought, can solve your debt issues? Which of you, by taking thought, can fix your own health? Which of you, by taking thought, can make yourself a little bit taller? Which of you, by taking thought, can find a good wife, find a husband? Which of you, by taking thought, can do anything in this life? Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. And God is just kind of challenging the mind with that. Can you do this great thing, like be one cubit taller? Just by taking thought of it, just by contemplating how you're going to do it and, and meditating upon these things. And why take ye thought for raiment? Verse 28. He likens it under the same thing. Do you realize what has to happen for, for God to provide you clothing and, and food and, and sustenance? I mean, we just think we just go to the grocery store and pick it up. But I, I think there's more that plays into that. First of all, the whole world economy would have to be such that the stuff can be produced and then it can be brought to by trains and trucks and automobiles into your grocery store. It's got to be placed there for you. You've got to have the resources to get You have to have the health. You have to have the health to gain wealth and to do all of those things. Every one of these things for something that we here think is so simple, like just grabbing groceries, there's a lot that comes into play. And it's just as much as, as he compares it, as gaining height by taking thought of it. God orchestrates so much in our life that we take for granted and he does that even with his provision for the simple necessities like food and clothing. And so he says, so why take you thought for the raiment? Verse 28, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast in the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, ye little of faith? And that's the thing that we're always missing when we start being double-minded in our prayer life. We have little faith. We don't trust that God is going to take care of all these things, and so instead we take thought of all these things. Therefore, take no thought. That's what he wants from us. Take no thought. What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewith shall we be clothed? For after all these things that the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth 
that ye have need of things. And not only does he know that you have need of these things, he knows how to get them to you. Okay, but you can't take thought of how to get these things to you. God will take care of it. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for tomorrow, for, to, for the morrow shall take thought uh, for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So, therefore, even as the prayer rounded out, for thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever and ever. Amen. Understanding that it's in God's hands entirely, that's what you need to be seeking first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. As you meditate upon him and as you pray unto him, round out your prayer, as God says, by giving all glory unto him. He's got the power. He's got the glory. He's got the kingdom. He's in charge of all these things and just leave it there. Leave it to him. And then seek after what is in his hands. What's in his hands? First of all, the kingdom. Seek you first the kingdom of right and his righteousness. Secondly, that exactly that, his righteousness. Our righteousness is his filthy rags, but his righteousness is Christ. So what do we have to do? Think about the kingdom. Seek the kingdom. Think about Christ. Seek Christ, and he's going to make all of these things account added to you without you even taking thought of it. See, when we spend most of our days meditating about our day and getting things in order and planning and scheduling. This is my whole life right now. i got schedules upon schedules. Any time in my phone, you can bring up... You can bring up my calendar and you'll find that I have 20 meetings going on at the same time. And it's all this planning and me trying to meticulously organize my life. My life would be much more suited, I think both professionally and spiritually, if I would stop taking care of these things and give them over to God. Seeking the kingdom, seeking his righteousness, and letting him orchestrate and organize and plan most of these things for me. Understood that there are certain things in the secular world you got to keep track of, but just in principle, seek God first and allow him to order things, I think is what is being, being uh, thought of in Christ's mind when he has us round out the prayer by saying, for thine is... Thine is the power. Thine is the kingdom. Thine is the glory forever and ever. Amen. So we need to, as it says in verse 7 of Matthew 7, just across the page, ask and it shall be given you. Matthew 7 and verse 7. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened Unto him, And notice it says that completely without reservation and without a, a way of contradicting that. Ask, seek, knock, and everyone that does shall receive, shall find, and have, shall have it opened. So God is saying, hey, if you ask and seek and knock unto the right person, you're going to get exactly what he promised would come in all those scenarios. Ask, seek, knock. Two, after, and, and, uh, and according to Jesus Christ, and after him, and after the Father, and it's him that all these things belong to, and therefore it's him that's going to be able to provide all of these things. So I'm going to read for you Psalm chapter 50 and verse 10. It says, For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. Look, he has no lack of anything that you need. Okay, back then, the cattle... And the beasts would be what would provide your meat, right? We go to the supermarket. Back then, you would have cattle that would provide those things for you. And the more cattle that a man had means he had more wealth. He could sell these things. He could multiply these things. He could use it to make clothing. He could use it to provide all sorts of things to himself and his family. But God here is saying, hey, I own all those beasts. I own the cattle on a thousand hills. I have no limit to what belongs unto me. And when we go to him, recognizing that it all belongs to him, we're simply asking for something out of the abundance of everything that he has. God has no lack. It's not like when we look, we look in the Old Testament, we see Solomon as having no lack. All the kings of the world coming to him for his wisdom, for his, for his knowledge, coming to him to simply be in his presence because he had all this greatness. They were bringing more to him, though he had abundance. Solomon, in, in, in all his glory, was not even arrayed better than a lily that spun and rode out of the ground. In the same way, Solomon in all his glory does not even compare to the father that provided him all these things. So don't go to the man Solomon for wisdom and for knowledge and for provision. Go to the father that provided all things according to him. Even when Solomon was at his riches, God still owned the cattle on a thousand hills. He had no lack, whereas Solomon could have had lack. And you know, two generations later, 
all that he had was basically dispersed and ruined and gone. He left it to sons that, that basically lost it all, blew it, wasted it all. Job in chapter 42 and verse 2 said this. He said, I know that thou canst do everything. I know that thou canst do everything. And this was after God made all these great truth statements and challenged him, saying things like, you know, um, who, who did this? Can you do this? Are you able to do this? And was just kind of throwing things at Job to make him understand this true statement that God canst do everything. He has everything in his power, everything in his control. Anything we can think of, God is able to do abundantly more above all we can ask, think, or meditate upon. Every great man or woman, then, of prayer, I believe, must come to the same realization that Job did in this case. I know that thou canst do everything. And as you're going through that model prayer, round it out by just saying a statement like that. I know that thou canst do everything. And while I've brought to you petitions, I've asked for you to forgive my trespasses. I've asked for you to help my illness and give me a, a life that is a straight and narrow walk, an easier life to do your will. I know, God, that you can do all things. Come to that realization, even as Job did. If you go back to Numbers chapter 11, I'll finish off there. Numbers chapter 11. In our prayer life, we need to come to the point where we're relying entirely upon God. We're bringing our meditations to Him. We're bringing our desires to Him. We're bringing our wants and our needs and our, and our every whim and just kind of laying it out to Him. But don't have that mind in the background that's always thinking about how you're going to figure these things out on your own. Give it to God and then know that he can do all things as Job did. He wants you to come to that realization that he is the one in control. That he is the one that has the kingdom in his hands. He is the one that has all power. He is the one to whom all glory is deserved. He wants that and he wants and desires to prove himself to be that in each and every one of our lives. Numbers chapter 11 and verse 21, the Bible says, And Moses said, The people among whom I am are six hundred thousand footmen. Okay? So Moses here is coming to God. As God says you know, to him, sanctify yourselves against the morrow, eat flesh, and he's going to provide something for the people. They were begging that they wanted the, the, the food of Egypt, the leeks of Egypt. They wanted the same things that they had when they were in Egypt, but they were here in the desert. And so Moses, I believe even as he had prayed to God and had that time of meditation where God said, go and sanctify yourselves, you're going to get the meat that you want. It seems like he had already been scheming and plotting and planning because he even counted how many footmen would be needed. And I bet you he counted how many plates would be needed and how many, how many uh, quail would be needed and how many leeks and garlic would be needed because he's like, how am I going to provide what God promised he was going to provide? How in the world am I going to do it? He says, the people among whom I am are 600,000 footmen, and thou hast said, I will give them flesh that they may eat a whole month. And he's like, how am I going to arrange that? I believe is what Moses was thinking, unfortunately. How am I going to provide what God said he was going to provide? I'm the leader of the people of Israel. I'm the mediator because 99% of these people don't want to talk to God, as they said by the mount, but they want to go through me. And Moses is like, how am I going to give them what God said in his word he would provide? Verse 22, he's, he's, he's starting to break it down, right? Shall the flocks and all the herds be slain for them to suffice them? Or shall all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them to suffice them? And that's what we do, right? God promises in his word to care for our basic needs. And above that, he promises to care for things, as we've been through this prayer thing, that are above, even our desires, even our wants, even things that would improve our lifestyles a little bit. God wants us to bring those petitions to him. And we go to him and we do just like Moses. God promises to provide something when we ask him according to his will. And then we're like, so shall I sell off this thing to provide for that? And shall I move my finances around this way? And maybe if I invest in that, maybe if, like he's saying here, all the flocks are slain and all the fish of the sea are gathered, then I could hypothetically do this. And, and if I cut out this and do more of that, and we're, we're in our minds 
just meditating about how we're going to figure out and solve our own problems when really we should just be giving it to God. He said it in his word and he promised in his word and we could go through and see all the blessed promises of provision and scriptures from God and, and the promises to maintain our health and the promises to bless those and, and, and that, that are loving him and seeking after him. He gives us all these promises and then we're just like Moses and we're like, well, how can I make this math work out? How can I, how can I, how can I align my steps in order to get to the end that God desires for me. He promised he would take me to X, Y, and Z, and now I've got to go A, B, C, D, and then you're kind of working it out in your own mind how you can do it. But God, he wants to prove himself, and he wants us to lean on him by faith. And so God stands up and says, and the Lord said unto Moses, verse 23, is the Lord's hand waxed short? Thou shalt see now whether my word shall come to pass unto thee or not. Okay? So as we're scheming in our prayer life about how we're going to answer our own prayers or how in this world and in this realm we can make our ends meet or get out of our health problem or get that person in our family saved, as we're praying to God and then double-minded in that when we're trying to you know, figure out our own way to answer our own prayers, God basically just says, my hand isn't waxed short. He's going to do a miracle. He's going to do something great and beyond our own expectation. And he says, Thou shalt see now whether my word shall come to pass unto thee or not. God is just in the business of having his people rely on him and understand that he is the one who is in control of all the kingdom. He is the one who has all the power. He is the one to whom all glory is deserved. And he wants you to come to that realization that I know that thou canst do everything. And then we would just give it over to him and stop worrying, stop plotting, stop planning, stop scheming about how we're going to solve our own issues and just bring them to God and then have no cares. Bring them in petition to the Father and then have no cares about how they will get resolved. Just trust in his word that he will provide as he has said he would provide. You don't go to God and say, all right, God, I need you to provide for me food on my table every day. Okay, I'm going to get a second job, and then I'm going to work this job between that, and then I'm going to stop buying so many of these so that I can provide that. No, God just comes to you and says, look, is my hand short? Has my hand grown short? You're going to see if my word is true. You're going to see if what I said to you shall come to pass. And it always does. Amen. And then on the other side, you see Moses kind of like, ah, oh, man. <laughs> Right? He's proven wrong by God, and you know what? A lot of times God's okay with that. He's okay with proving us wrong, just so that we would grow a little bit further in the area of our lives that is most important to him, and that's faith. Grow in faith. Follow the prayer example. Get to the end and just say, hey, God, thine is the kingdom. Thine is the power. Thine is the glory forever and ever. Amen. You're in charge of these things, and I leave you to it. And I just simply want to behold that now his word is going to come to pass as it promises. Your hand's not short, sure, God. Remind him of that. You can do this. I know you can because this all belongs to you. You're just simply gifting me of what you already have. Amen. And you end that prayer and you just, you just round it out and give him the glory and give him the praise for all of those things. I think you can learn something as we walk through this. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue in the prayer series a little bit. I'm probably going to go to some specific examples as how God's saints have used the outline that Jesus very clearly gave us to get God on their side and even change his mind in order that his petition, their petitions would be answered. We see even in this example here, Moses, where the anger of the Lord was greatly kindled against the people. And he basically says to Moses, you know what, I'm done with him. I'm going to wipe out all the people and start fresh with you. And Moses is like, you can't do this. Oh, what a, what a bold thing to say to God, right? You can't do this. Why? Well, because then Egypt's going to see and then the world's going to think that you brought them out here just to kill them. And they're not, they're not going to believe that you are a God that does according to his word. And God says, you know, fair enough. And he changes his mind and continues on with the people as promised. But he gives them what they asked for. It ends up not being a blessing, but rather a curse unto them because there's just so much food and they, they, they become engulfed with their lust for that thing. But God, again, is I believe he's just in the business of getting us in the same page as far as faith towards him goes. And he'll go to great lengths to do that, even, even negotiating a little bit. But let's not be the type of Christians that are in the business of always wanting to negotiate with God. But rather, come with faith, give your prayers to him, and just say, God, you're in control of these things. You take care of it as you will. Amen. And I think our lives would be a lot simpler. We wouldn't be trying to 
trying to figure out how many herds of flocks and fish we need to gather in order to get what God says to come to pass. Why do we think we can bring God's word to pass? We don't need to do that. He's, he's in the business of doing that himself. As he said, so shall it come to pass. Believe it by faith and just give it to him. And that's all we need to do from our end. Thank you, God, for all of